Happy Tuesday afternoon. This is Mr. Kennedy with the Mughal Empire PowerPoint. Sorry to not give you a fresh video last week. I apologize for reusing one from a previous semester. Unfortunately, people in my household got sick. It wasn't with COVID, but still, you know, small toddlers have to take care of things. But this week, fresh new video made just for your class. And we're going to talk about the Mughal Empire. Uh, this is an empire that was located in northern India. But to understand where the Mughal Empire comes from, we actually have to go back in time to about the 1200s. And we're going to start with the Mongols. Uh, the Mongol tribes are united in the late 1100s by a guy named Genghis Khan. And he's going to be the foundation of basically this entire lecture. Uh, originally, his name was Temujin, but he becomes known as Genghis Khan or Chinggis Khan, um, very quickly. Uh, conservative estimates state that he was responsible for uh, the mass extermination, famine, and death of over 20 million civilians. Um, Genghis Khan, he was also very prolific in the bedsheets. Uh, he has almost 20 million living descendants, which equates to about 0.5% of the entire world's population. So, Genghis is a big name. Uh, he reorganizes the Mongol system. He is going to slowly take over the Mongol tribes. Uh, they were originally five different tribes that combined into one. And he does this by weakening family ties. He spreads the wealth to others who are loyal to him. And slowly but surely, he's able to take the power away from his relatives. He establishes a capital in what is today Mongolia, and this capital is known as Karakorum. Uh, Karakorum, it does still exist today, but it only exists as ruins. Uh, there's no actual city there anymore. <clears throat> Genghis Khan, he gives people re religious freedom. He's supportive of international trade, and he exempts the poor from taxation. He encourages literacy amongst his people, and he even has a functioning mail system. Each mail messenger would ride about 25 miles from one station to the next, and each relay station had households that were serviced to it, kind of like a post office today. And all total, his postal service had 1,400 postal stations, 50,000 horses, 4,000 carts, and 6,000 boats. Um, now onto the military, because that's what they're really known for. Uh, their military was really big. For the early 1200s, uh, there were over 100,000 soldiers. And it's all based on the decimal system. Like the, the smallest squad was 10 soldiers, and then the next group up would have 100 soldiers, so on and so forth. So it was all based on the number 10. Military specials were recruited from all the lands they conquered. The soldiers were very lightly armored everything was based on speed and each horse actually had multiple horses or each soldier had multiple horses that they traveled with uh, when the mongols came up against an enemy they would offer the enemy the chance to surrender and pay a tribute uh, if they accepted they were spared of course um, but they had to support the mongol army they had to give men to the army and supplies if the enemy refused then they were just straight up destroyed and this idea of psychological warfare even went deeper than that. Um, if the city was destroyed, they would purposely let a couple of civilians escape so they could tell others about the destruction that the Mongols did. Now, Genghis will pass away in 1227, and his empire is going to be divided into four smaller empires. And the smaller empire that we really need to worry about is the Chagatai Khanate, because that's going to involve Central Asia, Afghanistan, and Northern India. Following the death of Genghis, we're going to come to a man about 150 years later named Timur the Lame, better known as Tamerlane. Now, his 
Empire is going to be born out of this desire to rebuild the Mongol Empire, but with a focus on Islam. And he's going to be really busy around the year 1380. Uh, he claims to be a direct descendant of Genghis Khan, and he conquers the area of his homeland known as Samarkand. And then from there, he's going to export his conquering to Persia, Afghanistan, northern India. Tamerlan, he treats cities that surrender peacefully and respectfully, but he destroys those that resist him. And much like Genghis Khan, he too did psychological warfare. Uh, he would build pyramids out of skulls to show that he meant business. Now, after Tamerlane dies, um, his kingdom will fall apart. But while his kingdom exists, what he would do is he would use existing tribal leaders to collect taxes on his behalf instead of having to put his own people into the area. After his kingdom falls apart, that's going to bring us to the actual Mughals. Now, real quick, who were the Mughals? Uh, who is this lesson really about? Well, a Mughal is a Muslim leader in India who rules over a Hindu kingdom. And Mughal is another translation, another word for the word Mongol. That's why Mongol and Mughal look so similar. There's a reason behind it. Those who become Mughal leaders were originally part of the Safavid Empire, which was right next door, but eventually they become separate. And the Mughal Empire is going to cover Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Northern India. Also, these Mughal leaders were very wealthy because they controlled the trade routes. They were the ones in charge of the Silk Road. The first Mughal is Baber. Uh, Baber, he reconquered Samarkand in 1497, and he begins to recreate the empire of Timur. Now, Baber, he is actually a direct descendant of both Tamerlane and Genghis Khan, and he thought it was his destiny to control political power. By the time he dies in the year 1530, he does control all of northern India, parts of Uzbekistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, a little bit of of um, Persia, the whole Central Asia region is his. Uh, he's not really a big fan of India. Uh, he doesn't like the caste system. He doesn't like Hinduism. He is a very strong proponent of Islam. And he dies in 1530 because of an unknown illness. He's replaced by his son, Himayun. And according to legend, Baber he bargains with Allah to take his life instead of uh, Himyun's. Himyun was very sick and expected to die. And after making this deal with Allah, the sun begins to get better. Babar begins to grow weaker. And when Himyun is completely healed, Babar finally passes away. Now, whether that's really what happened, if it was divine intervention, or if it was just coincidence, you know, we may never know. But Babar's son, Humayun, will take control of the empire. And Humayun, he's interested in poetry and astrology. Uh, he built a giant library, and that's what this is a picture of, called the Sher Mendel. Um, while Humayun is in charge, he faces this revolt from an Afghan leader named Sher Khan, who was able to unite parts of Humayun's family against him. And the civil war ends up lasting over 15 years. Now, Humyun, unfortunately for him, in the year 1556, he was on top of his library reading books up on the roof. And when he decided to come back down the stairs, uh, he tripped and he fell down the staircase while carrying an armload of books. And he unfortunately died because of the books and, well, falling down the stairs. Once Humayun passes away, his son, Akbar, uh, takes over. He becomes the new emperor, and he conquers even more territory. Now, Akbar, he inherited his dad's love of books, but he couldn't read because he had dyslexia, so he just had other people read to him. He was a fan of the European Renaissance. He invited Europeans to visit his kingdom, and that actually included people from the British 
East India Trading Company. And Akbar marks the beginning of what will become British colonialism in India. Akbar, he observed religious tolerance. He tried to end religious wars throughout his kingdom. Uh, he married a Hindu princess, he married Muslim women, and at Akbar's death, he had over 800 wives. Uh, even though he was religiously tolerant, uh, Muslims and Hindu princes had trouble with him, and when he tried to conquer Muslim and Hindu principalities, they would often fight back, even though he was somebody who wanted to unite both religions. Now, around the year 1600, Akbar's son, Jahangir, is going to rebel against Akbar and take over the empire. And it's almost ironic that as soon as Jahangir overthrows his, his dad, Akbar, one of Jahangir's own sons attempts to overthrow him. The difference, though, Jahangir is successful when he overthrows his dad, while the son who tries to overthrow Jahangir himself fails. Now, Jahangir, he's well-educated. He can speak four different languages, uh, but he's more interested in drinking and gambling than he is governing. And while he's not paying attention, his wife, Nur Jahan, ends up taking control of the government and she appoints many of her male relatives to government posts. And Jahangir kind of loses control of the government. Once Jahangir dies, his son Shah Jahan becomes the emperor. And one of the first things that Shah Jahan does is he overthrows his mother and puts her in prison. Shah Jahan, he's going to end the religious tolerance policies of the Mughals. He's going to institute strict Islamic policies and strict Islamic laws that start to fracture the empire. Now, one important thing that Shah Jahan does, he builds the Taj Mahal. Uh, so that's who the builder of the Taj Mahal is. It's this Shah Jahan guy. And the reason he does it is because he wants to build a tomb for his favorite wife, who was named Muntaz Mahal. Now, Shah Jahan's sons fought each other when they thought their father was on his deathbed. Three of the four sons died and the one living son, Aurangzeb, becomes the leader of the Mughal Empire. Now, Shah Jahan's not dead at this point. Shah Jahan ends up living an extra five years, but he's a prisoner of his own son. So his overson overthrows him and then throws him in prison. Now, Aurangzeb, uh, he increases the Islamification of India. He is going to institute strict Sharia law, or Sharia law, I should say. So this is going to be the same style of law that is being instituted in Afghanistan right now, coincidentally. He is going to be open in his hatred for Hinduism. He encourages Hindus to convert to Islam. He doesn't actually force converse, con, um, force people to convert, but if they do convert, they're showered with gifts, they're given political positions. If you stay a Hindu, if you do not convert, then there are special taxes that were forced upon you, and he also destroyed Hindu temples. They were demolished. On top of that, he also creates his moral police force that required citizens to verify they were Muslim. So it's not enough just to say you're Muslim, you have to be able to prove it to his secret police. If that's not bad enough, he also passed a law that required women to marry or be put to death. So uh, it's, it's probably obvious, but just in case it's not, by Aurangzeb's death, he's totally hated. The empire is falling apart, the Persian Empire is invading, and the, Bre the British East India Company is starting to take over. And these are the six Mughal emperors, if you want to know what they look like. You can kind of see the family resemblance there. So the top left is Baber. The top middle is Humayun. The right top is Akbar. Lower left is Jahangir. Lower middle is Shah Jahan. 
And then the last guy on the lower right, that is Aurangzeb there. Uh, what do you need to know about Mughal society? Well, the Mughal Empire, there were four ministers. There was the minister of the military, the minister of tax and revenue, the minister of legal and religious affairs, and then there was the minister for the royal household. Those ministers reported directly to the emperor. Below that were provincial governors who also reported directly to the emperor. Nobles who had the best military experience and the best administrative schools, they were the ones promoted and given the most land. And then the nobles were asked to send their tax money into the government. So this is a very skilled government where um, you do not go through the ranks based on money, you go through the ranks based on ability. And it just so happens those who are the most able were often the ones with the most money. For economics, uh, a lot of their economic system was based on agriculture. Uh, government officials would calculate the expected harvest for each part of the empire. And then the results of that expected harvest would give the expected tax that the people were supposed to pay. They also had trade relations with the East India companies, the Dutch East India Company and the British East India Company. And this spread Mughal goods and Mughal items throughout the world, especially in the textile trade. Um, clothing from these Mughal empires was worn around the world. In daily life, um, even if you were not a Hindu, your life revolved around the caste system or the clan system. And that was true even after converting to Islam. So even if you were of the Islamic faith, you still lived in the caste system that was based on Hinduism. Women spent most of their lives in seclusion from public where they ran the household and they raised the children. And then for religion, uh, for the most part, Hindus were given protections. For the most part, Hindus were allowed to continue worshiping according to their Hindu beliefs, but that doesn't mean it was easy. Penalties and taxes were often placed on those that did not convert to Islam. And the reason that these Islamic, these Muslim leaders tolerated Hinduism is because there's no way they could rule without the Hindu majority population allowing them to rule. There were Christians and there were Jews in the Mughal Empire. And according, keeping up with uh, Islamic tradition, Christians and Jews were both considered people of the book. And as long as they paid the taxes that were put on them, they were allowed to practice Christianity and Ju Judaism without any problem. And this protection and this respect for Christians actually allowed for friendly relations between the Mughal government and the European government. So that's your real quick look at what Mughal society looked like. This is India right before the British Empire comes in. Now next week's class will be on um, China and Japan. It's a pretty good lecture, but of course, I'm going to say that because I'm the one making it. But um, as always, any questions or comments or concerns, send me an email and I'll answer them as quickly as I can. And I look forward to um, talking to you again next week. We'll see you around. Bye.